Chapter One of Around the Campfire. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. Around the Campfire by Charles Roberts. Chapter One Off to the Squatooks, The Panther at the Parsonage, Bear versus Birchbark it was toward the end of july and uh, fredericton the little new brunswick capital had grown hot beyond endurance when six devoted canoeists stranian magnus queerman sam ranolf and myself heard simultaneously the voices of wild rapids calling to them from afar the desire of the woods awoke in us the vagrant blood that lurks in the veins of our race sprang up and refused to be still the very next day we fled from the city in starched collars seeking freedom and the cool of the wilderness it was toward lake temiscuata and the wilds of the squatooks that we set our eager faces in shirt-sleeves and moccasins we went for convenience we had our clothes stitched full of pockets our three good birch canoes and our other impedimenta we put on board a flat car at the station and that same evening found us at the village of edmonston where the matawaska flows into the st john at a point about one hundred and fifty miles above fredericton unless you are an experienced canoeman skilled not only with the paddle but with the pole and expert to run the roughest rapids you should take a guide with you on the squatook trip you should go in the bow of your canoe with a trusty indian in the stern one indian and one canoe for each man of the party the art of poling a birch bark against a stiff current is no easy one to acquire and needs both aptitude and practice your indian will teach you in the gentler waters the rest of the time you may lounge at your ease casting a fly from side to side and ever climbing on between the changing shores but as for us we needed no indians we were all six masters of canoe craft each took his turn at the white spruce pole and we conquered the currents rejoicing Timisquata is a long narrow lake just outside the boundaries of new brunswick it lies in the province of quebec but its outlet is the madawaska river a new brunswick stream our plan of proceeding was to take to the canoes at edmonton and pole fifteen miles up the matawaska make a portage of five miles across country to mud lake follow beardsley brook the outlet of mud lake to its junction with the squatook river and then slip down this swift stream with its chain of placid expansions till we should float out upon the waters of toledi lake toledi river would then receive us among its angry rapids and cascades to eject us forcibly at last upon the great bosom of temiscuata whence we should find plain paddling back to edmonston this would make a round trip of say one hundred and forty miles and all of them save the first fifteen with the current at edmonston that evening we pitched our tent beside the stream and next morning though it was raw and threatening we made an early start in one canoe went stranian and queerman in the second sam and ranolph in the third magnus and myself the bedding extra clothing etc laced up snugly in squares of oiled canvas made luxurious seats while the eatables were stored in light strong boxes built to fit the canoes the first day out is usually uneventful and this was no exception when adventures are looked for they pretty certainly fail to arrive we reached the portage with an hour of daylight to spare and there found an old log cabin which saved us the necessity of pitching our tent it was dry well ventilated abundantly uncivilized what a supper stranian cooked for us and then what a swarm of mosquitoes and midges flocked in to bid us welcome we hedged ourselves about with a cordon of slow fires of cedar bark the smoke of which proved most distasteful to them and almost equally so to us and then with a clear blaze crackling before the open door and our blankets spread on armfuls of spruce boughs we disposed ourselves luxuriously for pipes and yarns queerman drew a long blissful whiff through his corn-cob blew a succession of rings and murmured like a great bumblebee the world is vagabondia to him who is a vagabond 
well who'll tell us the first yarn inquired sam as his pipe drew freely stranion begins said magnus quietly magnus was a man of few words but when he opened his mouth what he said went he was apt to do more and say less than any one else in the party well boys said stranion if magnus says so here goes what shall i talk about who ever heard of stranion talking about anything but panthers jeered ranolf well assented stranion there's something in what you say the other night i was thinking over the various adventures which have befallen me in my devotion to birch and paddle it surprises me to find what a lot of scrapes i've got into with the panthers the brutes seem to fairly haunt me of course fellows who go every year into the squatook woods are bound to have adventures more or less you get cornered maybe by an old bull moose or have a close shave with some excited bear or strike an unusually ugly lynx or get spilled out of the canoe when you're trying to run to leedy falls but in my case it is a panther every time whenever i go into the woods there is sure to be one of these creatures sneaking around i declare it makes me quite uneasy to think of it though i've always got the best of them so far i'll bet you a trout there are one or two spotting me now from those black thickets on the mountain and one of these days if i don't look sharp they'll be getting even with me for all the members of their family that i have cut off in their sins oh you go long exclaimed sam you're getting sentimental i can tell you i have killed more trout than you have panthers and there's no old patriarch of a trout going to get even with me sam's practical remark went unheeded and in a few moments stranion resumed you see boys the beasts began to haunt me in my very cradle so to speak did any of you ever hear mother tell that story i have ejaculated queerman but the rest of us hastened to declare our ignorance very well said stranion queerman shall see that i stick to the facts oh boys i've a heavy contract on hand then cried queerman but stranion blandly ignored him and continued i'll call this tale the panther at the parsonage you have all seen the old parsonage at the mouth of the keswick river that's a historic edifice for you therein was i born there were more trees around it then than now at the mature age of ten months i moved away from that neighborhood but not before the indian devil as the panther is called in that region had found me out and marked me as a foreordained antagonist one bright june morning when i was about five months old and not yet able to be much protection to my young mother my father set out on one of his long parochial drives and we were left alone no not quite alone there was susan the kitchen girl for company that constituted the garrison of the parsonage on that eventful morning mother susan and myself i cannot say i remember what took place but i have so often been told it that i feel as if i had taken an active part mother and i were sitting by an open window downstairs looking out on the front yard when suddenly mother called out sharply susan susan come here and see what sort of creature this is coming through the grove there was a frightened ring in my mother's voice which brought susan promptly to her side just then the creature which was long and low and stealthy reached the garden fence it mounted the fence gracefully and paused to look about with a horrified gasp mother caught me to her bosom and whispered it's a tiger no em cried susan it ain't no tiger but it's an injun devil which is pretty nigh as bad and she ran and slammed down the window the noise attracted the brute's attention he glanced our way dropped to the ground and crept stealthily toward the house the attic cried mother wildly all the windows downstairs are wide open i need hardly assure you boys it didn't take those two women and me very long to get upstairs as we reached the top we heard a crash in the parlor and mother nearly squeezed me to death in her terror for me but susan exclaimed almost gleefully i declare if he ain't got in the wrong winder parlor door shut by this time we were on the attic stairs and the door at the foot of the stairs a solid old-fashioned country door was safely bolted behind us that door was the only means of access to the attic and on the head of the stairs we all sat down to take breath then in mother the anxious housewife began to reappear what has that horrid brute broke in the parlor susan she queried 
i must have been them dishes on the little table by the winder ma'am responded the girl and then we heard a clatter again as the beast in springing out of the window knocked the fragments of pottery aside in a few moments he found another entrance the soft pat-pat of his great furry feet could be heard on the lower stairs he was evidently hungry and much puzzled at our sudden disappearance we could hear him sniffing around in and out of the bedrooms and at last that soft persistent tread found its way to the attic door how he did sniff about the bottom of that door till the blood of his prisoners ran cold with horror then he began to scratch which was more than they could stand terror lent them invention and mother put me into a basket of old clothes while she helped susan drag a heavy bedstead to the head of the stairs this bedstead effectually blocked the narrow stairway and when they had piled a chest of drawers on top of it they once more felt secure all this trouble was unneeded however as that door opening outward was an insurmountable barrier to the panther in a few minutes he stole away restlessly then we heard some flower pots which stood on the window ledge of the front bedroom go crash on the steps below the indian devil was getting out of the window now the attic in which we had taken refuge was lighted by two windows a small one in the gable looking out upon the barnyard and the other a very small skylight reached by a sort of fixed step-ladder from the attic floor as soon as mother heard the animal's claws on the side of the house she thought of the skylight and cried to susan to shut it the skylight had an outer shutter of wood which was closed in winter time to keep the heavy snowfall from breaking the glass this shutter was now thrown back upon the roof and the inner sash was raised a few inches for the sake of ventilation susan fairly flew up the ladder and pulled out the little stick that supported the sash she had barely got the hook slipped into the staple when the panther's round head and big light eyes appeared within a foot of her face she gave a startled shriek and fell down the ladder at this juncture the two women gave themselves up for lost and mother seizing an old curtain pole which lay among the attic lumber prepared to sell my infant life at a pretty high figure all escape from the attic was blocked by the articles they had so carefully wedged into the stairway this it would take them some time to clear they never imagined that so fierce a brute as the panther could be stopped by an ordinary sash and glass however strong but the indian devil is wary and this one was suspicious of the glass when on attempting to put his head down through the skylight he met with an obstacle where he did not see any he thought he detected a trap he sniffed all over each pane stopping every moment to eye us angrily then he scratched but very gingerly at the sash and only tore away some splinters the sash was stout and new at last he thrust his muzzle over roughly against the pane and his nose went through the glass susan sank in a heap while mother with deadly purpose grasped her curtain pole expecting instant attack it was not to be so however for which the world is much to be congratulated the panther cut his nose pretty severely on the broken glass and shrank back snarling viciously he was more than ever convinced that the skylight was a trap and would not trust his muzzle again in the opening observing the beast's caution mother plucked up new hope she remembered having read that lions and tigers were afraid of fire and forthwith she hit on a truly brilliant expedient get up susan she commanded and be of some use go and light that lamp on your washstand and bring it to me susan obeyed with alacrity cheered by the thought that there was anything left to do when the lamp was brought mother laid the chimney aside and turned up the wick so as to give a flaring smoky blaze then she handed the lamp back to susan take it she said and set it on the top of the ladder right under the broken pane this was too much for poor susan oh i, I dasn't th th never she whimpered backing hastily out of her mistress's reach mother regarded her with withering scorn then turned and looked at me where i lay close behind her in a basket of old clothes assuring herself that the panther could not get me in her absence she seized the lamp and marched up the ladder with it 
the panther growled most menacingly and thrust his face down to the opening but as the smoke and flame came under his nose he snarled and drew back on the very topmost step did mother deposit the lamp where it blazed right up through the broken pane as she turned down the ladder the panther's claws were heard above the shingles beating a reluctant retreat in a moment or two he was heard on the shed and then mother opened the skylight reached out and clapped down the wooden shutter susan's courage revived now that the danger was over mother picked me out of the basket and gathered me again to her bosom while susan began to speculate on what the panther would be up to next on this point she was not long left in doubt in the corner of the barnyard was a pig pen inhabited at the time by a pig three months old presently the poor little pig set up a terrific squealing and mother and susan rushed to the gable window as i have said before this window commanded a view of the barnyard the panther was on the roof of the pen peering down through the cracks and scratching vigorously to gain an entrance baby had been denied him but pork he was determined to have the pig squealed in a way that mother trusted would alarm the neighborhood and tried to hide himself in the straw from the reach of those pale cruel eyes at last the panther quitted the roof and found the pen door here he paused a moment or two suspecting another trap then finding nothing suspicious in he glided there was one terrific squeal and all was still i fancy mother and susan both wept thinking how well the fate of the poor piggy might have been their own and mine for a long while the two women kept watch at the window at last the panther reappeared walking very lazily and licking his chops he glanced at the house in a good-natured fashion as if he bore us no grudge cleaned his great face with one paw sniffed the air thoughtfully in various directions and then made off towards the woods and we knew that our pig went with him when he was well out of sight mother and susan removed the barricades and forsook the attic you may be sure they fastened every window kept a keen outlook and went about their work in fear and trembling when my father got home in the middle of the afternoon he heard the story before he could unharness the horse straightway he set out again and organized a hunting party among the neighbors the party was armed with all sorts and conditions of weapons but it bagged that panther before sundown whereby was my mother much consoled and now have i stuck to the facts said stranion turning to queerman oh, to my surprise you have responded the latter well went on stranion unruffled since the panthers got after me so early it's not much cause for wonder if they've kept it up at this moment a strange unearthly gurgling cry broke the night stillness and we started involuntarily there is one of mine ancient enemies now said stranion i'm sure to fall foul of him to-morrow and one or the other of us will rue the day well said sam we all know it won't be stranion the story done i rose and replenished the fire while magnus passed around a tin of hot coffee a whippoorwill threshing the summer dusk with his gold flail of song was heard in a hillside thicket and a queerman cried listen to him boys no said stranion we'll now give our very best attention while sam tells us one of his old bear stories indeed said sam with an indignant sniff i'll tell you one i never told before and a true one at that now don't interrupt for i intend to do it up in a somewhat literary fashion to save the old man trouble in writing it down oh, thank you kindly said i i was the official scribe of the party and familiarly known as the old man or simply o m for short bear versus birch bark continued sam is the title of my narrative it was on the upper waters of the oromocto river that the case of bear versus birch bark was decided thither had alec hammond and i betaken ourselves in our canoe to kill some oromocto trout the oromocto is for the most part much less rapid than other trout rivers of new brunswick in fact for long distances its current is quite sluggish a characteristic finely suited to our indolence of mood paddling quietly or a poling when the water was swift we soon left behind us all traces of civilization 
instead of beautiful open meadow shores shaded with here and there a mighty elm or ash we entered the ruggedest part of the original wilderness where the soil was too barren and stony to tempt even a squatter and where the banks were clothed with dark hemlocks to the water's edge sometimes these sombre woods gave back a space and a wild confusion of many kinds of trees took their place pines ash birch basswood larch and beech mixed with fallen trunks and staring white boulders sometimes again in the midst of the most impenetrable forest a delightful little patch of interval or dry waterside meadow would open up before us inviting us to pitch our tent amid its deep soft grasses scattered through the grass were clumps of tall wild lilies their orange blossoms glowing amid the green and around the stately heads of the wild parsnips which made the air heavy with rich perfume fluttered and clung the silver-throated bobolinks what wonder we rested when we came to these wilderness gardens whose possession there was none to dispute with us we found that as a rule we might count upon an ice-cold brook near by wherever such brooks flowed in there would be a deep pool or an eddy covered with foam clusters or a pebbly musical rapid which meant a day of activity for our rods and reels and flies one day after such a morning with the trout as had left our wrists well tired we were inclined to give our rods a resting spell the afternoon was sultry and drowsy it was toward the close of july and alec's highest ambition was to take a long siesta in the tent floor where an overhanging beech tree kept off the sun and a sweet breeze seemed to have established its headquarters there was no wind elsewhere that i could perceive yet around our tent a soft breath of it was wandering all the day for my part i didn't feel like loafing or lotus-eating the fever for specimens was upon me i have an intermittent passion as you know for the various branches of natural history and am given at times to collecting birds and plants and insects this afternoon i had visions of gorgeous butterflies rare feathered fowl and various other strangely lovely things thronging my brain so i put into the canoe my gauze net and double-barreled breech loader and set off upstream in a vague search after some novelty let me confess it my taste was destined to be gratified beyond my hopes above our camping-ground the river for some distance was swift and deep beyond this it widened out and became almost as motionless as a lake along these still reaches the shores were comparatively low and less heavily wooded with here and there a little corner of meadow a bit of wet marsh covered with cattail flags or a dense fragrant thicket of indian willow there were water-lily leaves in broad patches right across the stream and the air was gay with green and purple dragonflies which lit on my gunwale and glittered in the sun like jewels there was not even a rustle of leaves to break the silence at last as i noiselessly rounded a low bushy point right ahead i saw a splendid blue heron which was watching intently for minnows in the shallow water he spread his broad wings and rose instantly i had just time to let him have one barrel as he disappeared over a thicket of alders flying so low that his long legs swept their tops i felt certain i had hit him for straight away arose a great crackling and struggling among the bushes beyond in my haste i failed to notice that this disturbance was rather too violent to be proceeding from any wounded bird unless it were a dodo running my birch ashore alongside of a mouldering trunk which had fallen with half its length in the stream i made my way gun in hand through the underwood without stopping to load my empty barrel there was no sign of blue herons where my bird was supposed to have fallen but to my unlimited astonishment i beheld a black bear cub making off at his very best speed badly scared at my sudden appearance he gave a curious bleat of alarm and redoubled his efforts to escape he had little cause for alarm however as i did not want him for a specimen and had i wanted him ever so much i could not well have bagged him with no heavier ammunition than birdshot i was watching his flight with a sort of sympathetic amusement when with a most disagreeable suddenness and completeness the tables were turned upon me 
in the underbrush behind me i heard a mighty crashing and there to my dismay was the old she-bear in a fine rage rushing to the rescue of her offspring considering that the offspring's peril was not immediate i thought she need not have been in such a tremendous hurry she had cut off my retreat she was directly in the line of my sole refuge my faithful and tried birch-bark there was no time left for meditation i darted straight toward the enemy undaunted by this boldness she rose upon her hind legs to give me a fitting reception when almost within her reach i fired my charge of bird-shot right in her face which not unnaturally seemed somewhat to confuse her for a moment it was a moment's diversion in my favour i made the most of it i dashed past and had gained some paces toward the canoe when my adversary was again in full chase more furious than ever as i reached the canoe she sprang on the other end of the log and was almost aboard of me ere i could seize the paddle and thrust out fortunately i had headed down stream for the mad brute took to the water without hesitation had the stream been deep i should merely have laughed at this but in these shallows it was no laughing matter the channel was deep enough to impede the bear's running but by no means to make running impossible i felt that the question of speed between us was now a painfully doubtful one my back bent to the paddle the broad blade flashed through the water with all the force and swiftness i was master of close behind though i could not spare time to look back i could hear the animal plunging in pursuit and i was drenched with the spray of her splashings i was a skilful canoeist i have won many races but never was another canoe race i was so bent upon winning as this one at last snatching a glance over my shoulder i saw that i had gained though but slightly it was well i had for the tremendous pace was one which i could keep up no longer i knew the deep water was still far ahead and i knew too the obstinacy and tireless strength of my pursuer there was therefore a grave uncertainty in my mind as to whether i could succeed in holding the lead much longer i slackened a little saving my strength all i could but the bear at once made up her lost ground and my breathing space was brief at a little short of my best but still at a killing pace enough i found i could keep out of reach but if a shoal should come in the way or a sunken log or any like obstruction the game was up with this chance in view i had little leisure for watching my pursuer's progress i could hear however and feel quite too much of it after what seemed an age of this desperate racing we came to a part of the stream where i expected a change in my favour for a quarter of a mile i would have a fair current in a narrower and deeper channel here i gained ground at once i relaxed my efforts a good deal gave my aching arms a moment's rest and watched the angry bear wallowing clumsily after me able now neither to run nor swim this ended the matter i fondly imagined and i drew a long sigh of relief but i was far yet from being out of the wood i had begun to hullo too soon when the bear saw that i was about to escape she took to the land which just here was fairly open and unobstructed and to my horror she came bounding after me along the water's edge at a rate which i could not hope to rival but in the pause i had recovered my breath and my strength i shot onward and my antagonist had a hard gallop before she overhauled me i could mark now every bound of her great black form the sharp chattering laugh of a kingfisher startled me and i noticed the bird fly off downstream indignant how i wished i might borrow his wings just then the bear having got a little in advance of me sprang for midstream so sagaciously timing her effort that had i kept on she must inevitably have seized or upset me but it was this i was on the watch for in the nick of time i backed water with all my might swerved aside and darted past close behind her so close that i could have clutched her shaggy hindquarters i had no special reason for attempting this feat however so i sped on and now began a second stretch of shoals for the next half mile it was much the same old story save that i had gained a better start 
there was one little variation however which came near making an end of the whole affair in rounding a sharp turn i did just what i had been dreading ran aground it was only on the skirts of a sloping shoal and i was off again before i had time to think but the distance betwixt pursuer and pursued had grown painfully less in that moment i could all but feel the animal's hot breath upon the back of my neck the strain was terrible but soon i began to take heart again i thought to myself that surely i could hold out till clear of these last shallows and after that i knew the shores were such as might be expected to baffle even this most indomitable of bears when again we reached deep water i was paddling a splendid stroke and the bear apparently as fresh and as wrathful as ever was floundering along perhaps two canoe lengths in the rear by this time the camp was in sight a good half mile off i saw alec come lazily out of the tent take a glance at the situation and dart back again gun in hand he reappeared and ran up the shore to meet us feeling that now i had matters pretty well in my own way i waved him back so he took his stand on the summit of a precipitous bluff and awaited his chance for a shot as soon as the bear found herself again compelled to swim with a snort and a growl she turned shoreward to repeat her former manoeuvre she took the opposite shore to that occupied by alec the banks were steep and crumbly clothed along top with bushes and fallen trees and rocks and a tangle of wild vines yet the unwearied brute managed to overcome these difficulties by her stupendous strength and actually outstripped me once more it was all she could accomplish however and just as she sprang for the canoe the edge of the bank gave way beneath her weight and in an avalanche of stones and loose earth she rolled head over heels into the river i was far away before she could recover herself i saw she was utterly disgusted with the whole thing she clambered ashore and on the top of the bank stood stupidly gazing after me then i laughed and laughed till my overstrained sides were near bursting i could hear peals of mirth from alec at his post on the bluff and was calmed at last by a fear lest his convulsions might do him some injury reaching the landing-place i only waited to pull the canoe's nose up onto the grass then threw myself down quite exhausted a moment later the bear gave herself a mighty shaking and accepting her defeat moved sullenly back upstream as sam concluded stranion rose and gravely shook him by the hand i congratulate you on winning your case said he and now being first night out let's all turn in or we'll be fagged to-morrow it is hard to get to sleep the first night in camp and i was awake for an hour after all the rest were snoring i lay listening to the soft confusion of night sounds till at last the liquid gabble of a shallow below the camp faded into an echo of cathedral bells and while i was yet wondering at the change i found the morning sun in my face and saw stranion holding out a tin of hot coffee i sprang up and found myself the laggard of the crowd come to breakfast cried stranion lynch is here and it's time we were over the portage tom lynch was a lumberman whom we had engaged by letter to come with his team and drag and haul our canoes over to mud lake his team was a yoke of half-wild brindle steers the portage was five miles long the way an unvarying succession of ruts mud holes and stumps and mr lynch's vocabulary like his temper was exceedingly vivacious yet the journey was accomplished by the middle of the afternoon and with no bones broken the flies and mosquitoes were swarming but we inflicted upon them a crushing defeat by the potent aid of a slitheroo this magic fluid consists of stockholm tar and tallow spiced with pennyroyal and boiled to about the consistency of treacle it will almost keep a grizzly at bay by half-past three in the afternoon we were launched upon the unenchanting bosom of mud lake upon perhaps three miles in circumference weedy and swarming with leeches it hardly exceeds two feet in apparent depth but its bottom is a fathomless slime stirred up vilely at every dip of the paddle its low marshy shores fringed here and there with dead bushes and tall charred trunks 
afforded us but one little bit of beauty the green and living corner where beardsley's brook flows out at this season the brook was very shallow so that we had often to wade beside the canoes and ease them over the shallows and now sam did a heroic thing he volunteered to let the rest of us do the work while he waded on ahead to catch some trout for supper it was by no means unpleasant wading down this bright and rippling stream whose banks were lovely with overhanging trees through which the sunlight came deliciously tempered time slipped by as sweetly as the stream but a little surprise was in store for us we were descending a beautiful alder fringed reach when around a bend below us appeared sam with undignified impetuosity he struggled toward us knee-deep in the current dashing up the spray before him his eyes as wide as saucers a bear a bear he gasped and hurling down his rod and fish in the canoe he seized a heavy revolver we had grasped our weapons precipitately and halted but sam urged us on leading the way as thus full armed we pressed forward downstream he told us in a suppressed voice how as he angled and meditated and there was no sound save the hushed tumult of a little rapid or the recurrent swish of his line suddenly from the bank behind him rose the angry blatant growl which he knew for the utterance of a she-bear with cubs at this he had felt indignant and startled and with a terrific yell had hurled a stone into the bushes as a hint that he was a bad man and not to be trifled with thereupon had arisen a roar which put his yell to shame the undergrowth had rocked and crashed with the swift approach of the monster and filled with penitential misgivings he had made haste to flee when we reached the scene of the possible tragedy however the bear or bears had disappeared we grieved not greatly for their absence end of chapter one chapter two of around the campfire by charles roberts this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter two the camp at beardsley brook by this time the stream having taken in two or three small tributaries had grown deep enough to float us in comfort a little before dusk we reached a spot where some previous party had encamped and had left behind a goodly store of elastic hemlock boughs for bedding we took the hint and pitched tent sam's trout were a dainty item on our bill of fare that night our camp was in a dry but gloomy grove and we piled the campfire high when the pipes were all well going i remarked it's time magnus gave us a story now hear hear cried every one but magnus one of your own adventures magnus urged queerman be content to be your own hero for once i'll tell you a story my uncle told me said magnus with a quiet smile and the o m can enter it in his notebook as a tiger's plaything my uncle colonel jack anderson a retired officer of the english army was a reticent man he had never explained to me the cause of a certain long red scar which starting from the grizzled locks behind his ear ran diagonally down his ruddy neck and was lost beneath his ever immaculate shirt collar but one night an accidental circumstance led him to tell the story we were sitting cosily over his study fire when his cat came stalking in with sanguinary elation holding a mouse in her mouth she stood growling beside my chair till i applauded her and patted her for her prowess then she withdrew to the middle of the room and began to play with her half-dazed victim till colonel jack got up and gently put her outside in order to conclude the exhibition on his return my uncle surprised me by remarking that he could not look without a shudder upon a cat tormenting a mouse as i knew that he had looked quite calmly on occasion into the cannon's mouth i asked for an explanation do you see this asked the colonel touching the scar with his lean brown finger i nodded attentively whereupon he began his story in india once i went out on a hot dusty plain near the ganges with my rifle and one native servant to see what i could shoot 
it was a dismal place here and there were clumps of tall grass and bamboos with now and then a tamarisk tree parrots screamed in the trees and the startled caw of some indian crows made me pause and look around to see what had disturbed them the crows almost at once settled down again into silence and as i saw no sign of danger i went on carelessly i was alone for i had sent back my servant to find my match-box which i had left at the place of my last halt but i had no apprehensions for i was near the post and the district was one from which as was supposed the tigers had been cleared out some years before just as i was musing upon this fact with a tinge of regret because i had come too late to have a hand in the clearance i was crushed to the ground by a huge mass which seemed to have been hurled upon me from behind my head felt as if it had been dashed with icy or scalding water and then everything turned black if i was stunned by the shock it was only for an instant when i opened my eyes i was lying with my face in the sand not knowing where i was or what had happened i started to rise when instantly a huge paw turned me over on my back and i saw the great yellow-green eyes of a tiger looking down upon me through their narrow black slits i did not feel horror-stricken in fact so far as i can remember i felt only a dim sense of resignation to the inevitable i also remember that i noticed with curious interest that the animal looked rather gratified than ferocious i don't know how long i lay there stupidly gazing up into the brute's eyes but presently i made a movement to sit up and then i saw that i still held my rifle in my hand while i was looking at the weapon with a vague harassing sense that there was something i ought to do with it the tiger picked me up by the left shoulder and made off with me into the jungle and still i clung to the rifle though i had forgotten what use i should put it to the grip of the tiger's teeth upon my shoulder i felt but numbly and yet as i found afterwards it was so far from gentle as to have shattered the bone having carried me perhaps half a mile the brute dropped me and raising her head uttered a peculiar soft cry two cubs appeared at once in answer to the summons and bounded up to meet her at the first glimpse of me however they sheered off in alarm and their dam had to coax them for some minutes rolling me over softly with her paw or picking me up and laying me down in front of them before she could convince them that i was harmless at last the youngsters suffered themselves to be persuaded they threw themselves upon me with eager though not very dangerous ferocity and began to maul and worry me their claws and teeth seemed to awaken me for the first time to a sense of pain i threw off the snarling little animals roughly and started to crawl away in vain the cubs tried to hold me the mother lay watching the game with satisfaction instinctively i crept toward a tree and little by little the desire for escape began to stir in my dazed brain when i was within a foot or two of the tree the tiger made a great bound seized me in her jaws and carried me back to the spot whence i had started why i thought to myself this is just exactly the way a cat plays with a mouse at the same moment a cloud seemed to roll off my brain no words of mine my boy can describe the measureless and sickening horror of that moment when realization was thus suddenly flashed upon me at the shock my rifle slipped from my relaxing fingers but i recovered it desperately with a sensation as if i had been falling over a precipice i knew now what i wanted to do with it the suddenness of my gesture however appeared to warn the tiger that i had yet a little too much life in me she growled and shook me roughly i took the hint you may be sure and resumed my former attitude of stupidity but my faculties were now alert enough and at the cruelest tension again the cubs began mauling me i repelled them gently at the same time looking to my rifle i saw that there was a cartridge ready to be projected into the chamber i remembered that the magazine was not more than half empty i started once more to crawl away with the cubs snarling over me and trying to hold me and it was at this point i realized that my left shoulder was broken having crawled four or five feet i let the cubs turn me about 
whereupon i crawled back toward the old tiger who lay blinking and actually purring it was plain that she had made a good meal not long before and was therefore in no hurry to dispatch me within about three feet of the beast's striped foreshoulder i stopped and fell over on my side as if all but exhausted my rifle barrel rested on a little tussock the beast moved her head to watch me but evidently considered me past all possibility of escape for her eyes rested as much upon her cubs as upon me the creatures were tearing at my legs but in this supreme moment i never thought of them i had now thoroughly regained my self-control laboriously very deliberately i got my sight and covered a spot right behind the old tigress's foreshoulder low down from the position i was in i knew this would carry the bullet diagonally upward through the heart i should have preferred to put a bullet in the brain but in my disabled condition and awkward posture i could not safely try it just as i was ready one of the cubs got in the way and my heart sank the old tiger gave the cub a playful cuff which sent it rolling to one side the next instant i pulled the trigger and my heart stood still my aim had not wavered a hair's breadth the snap of the rifle was mingled with a fierce yell from the tiger and the long barred body straightened itself up into the air and fell over almost on top of me the cubs sheered off in great consternation i sat up and drew a long breath of thankful relief the tiger lay beside me stone dead i was too weak to walk at once so i leaned against the body of my vanquished foe and rested my shoulder was by this time setting up an anguish that made me think little of my other injuries nevertheless the scene about me took on a glow of exquisite colour so great was the reaction that the very sunlight seemed transfigured i know i fairly smiled as i wrapped the cubs on the mouth with my rifle barrel i felt no inclination to shoot the youngsters but i would have no more of their over ardent attentions the animals soon realized this and lay down in the sand beyond my reach evidently waiting for their mother to reduce me to proper submission i must have lain there half an hour and my elation was rapidly subsiding before the agony in my shoulder when at last my man gunjeet appeared tracking the tiger's traces with stealthy caution he had not waited to go for help but had followed up the beast without delay bowing to save me or avenge me ere he slept his delight was so sincere and his courage in tracking the tiger alone was so unquestionable that i doubled his wages on the spot the cubs on his approach had run off into covert and so we set out at once for the post when i got there i was in a raging fever which with my wounds kept me laid up for three months on my recovery i found that gunjeet had gone the next day and captured the two cubs which he had sent down the river to benares while the skin of the old tiger was spread luxuriously on my lounge so you will not wonder concluded the colonel that the sight of a cat playing with a mouse has become somewhat distasteful to me since that experience i have acquired so keen a sympathy for the mouse while magnus was speaking a heavy rain had begun it had little by little beaten down our fire and now as the wind was abroad in the hemlocks and the forest world was gloomy we laced the tent doors and lit our candles it was announced by some one that queerman's turn had come to speak he grumbled an acquiescence and then dreamed a while and in the expectant stillness the rush of rain the clamour of currents and the lonely murmur of the tree-tops crept into our very souls we thought of the sea and when queerman spoke there was a vibration in his voice as of changing tides and the awe of mighty shores magnus said he your tale was most dusty and hot though not too dusty if i may be allowed to say so it was of the earth earthy mine will be of the water watery it may be entered in the o m s log as a fight with the hounds of the sea it was just before daybreak on a dewy june morning of eighteen eighty seven when a party of four set out to drift for shad 
there was the rector whom you know my cousin b whom you don't know and myself whom you think you know we went to learn how the business of drifting was conducted there was also the old fisherman chris the owner of the shad boat he went for fish by the time the long fathoms of brown net were unwound from the great creaking reel and coiled in the stern of the boat the tide had turned and a current had begun to set outward from the little creek in which our boat was moored our rusty mainsail was soon hoisted to catch the gentle cat paws from the shore and we were under way a word of explanation here the shad fishing of the bay of fundy is carried on for the most part by drifting the boats employed are roomy heavy single-masted craft with a cuddy or forward cabin in which two men may sleep with comfort these craft when loaded draw several feet of water and are hard to float off when they chance to run aground they carry a deep keel and are staunch sea boats as all boats need to be to navigate the rude waters of the fundy when we had gained a few cable lengths from shore the breeze freshened slightly it was a mere zephyr but it drove the boat too fast for us to pay out the net we furled the sail and thrust the boat along slowly with our heavy sweeps while chris paid out the net over the stern these fundy boats sometimes stay out several tides making a haul with each tide but it was our intention merely to drift out with this ebb and return by the next flood it was slow work for a while we ate told stories speculated as to how many fish were entangling themselves in our meshes and at about nine o'clock appealed to chris to haul in the tremendous tide had drifted us in five hours over twenty miles we decided to run the boat into the mouth of a small river on our right to take a good swim before we started on the return trip the plan was accepted by chris and we set ourselves to haul in the net in the centre of the boat stood two huge tubs into which we threw the silvery shad as we took them from the meshes when we found a stray skate squid or sculpin we returned it to its native element but a small salmon we welcomed as a special prize and laid it away in a wrapping of sailcloth the catch proved to be rather a light one though chris averred it was as good as any he had made that year why what has become of the shad asked the rector it seems to me that in former years one could sometimes fill these tubs in a single trip ay ay growled chris that's true enough sir but the fishin ain't now what it used to be and it's all along o them blamed dogfish what do the dogfish have to do with it i asked do with it answered chris why they eat em they eat everything they can clap their eyes on to they're thicker than bees in these here waters the last year or two back they are a kind of small shark i believe put in the rector in a tone of inquiry well i reckon as how they be and they're worse nor any other kind as i've heerd tell of because they kind o hunt in packs like and nothin ain't a goin to escape them once they get on to it i've caught em nine to four feet long but mostly they run from two to three foot they're spry i tell ye and with a mouth on to em like a fox trap they're the worst varmint that swims and good for nothin but to take ile out of their livers i've heard them called the hounds of the sea said b are they bold enough to attack a man they'd attack an elephant if they could get him in the water and they'd eat him too said chris i hope they won't put in an appearance while we're taking our swim remarked the rector don't think we had better swim far out by this time we were near the mouth of the stream a broad shallow estuary three or four hundred yards wide in the middle was a gravelly shoal which was barely uncovered at low water and was then marked by a line of seaweed and small stones we bore up the northern channel and saw that the shores were stony and likely to afford us a firm landing but the channel was unfamiliar to chris and suddenly with a soft thud we found ourselves aground in a mud-bank a hundred yards from shore the tide had yet a few inches to fall and we knew that we were fast for an hour or so when we had got ourselves out of our clothes the surface of the shoal in mid-channel was bare it was about fifty yards from the boat and we decided to swim over to it and look for anemones and starfish 
b who was an indifferent swimmer took an oar along with him to rest on if he should get tired we laughed at him for the precaution as the distance was so short but he retorted if any of those sea dogs should turn up you'll find that said oar will come in pretty handy the water was of a delicious temperature and we swam floated and basked in a leisurely fashion when we had reached the bar the tide was about to turn the fundy tides may be said to have practically no slack they have to travel so fast and so far that they waste no time in idleness we hailed chris whom we had left in the boat and told him the tide had turned chris rose from his lounging attitude in the stern and took a look at the water the next moment he was on his feet yelling all aboard all aboard here's the dogfish a-comin b and i took the water at once but the rector stopped us back he commanded they're upon us already and our only chance is here in the shoal water till chris can get the boat over to us even as he spoke we noted some small black fins cutting the water between the boat and our shoal we turned back with alacrity the first thing chris did was to empty both barrels of my fowling piece among the advancing fins at once a great turmoil ensued caused by the struggles of two or three wounded dogfish the next moment their struggles were brought to an end their companions tore them to pieces in a twinkling the rector shouted to chris to try to throw us the boat hook it was a long throw but chris's sinews rose to the emergency and the boat hook landed nearly at our feet the boat hook was followed by a broken gaff which struck the sand at the farther side of the shoal meanwhile between us and the boat the water had become alive with dogfish our shoal sloped so abruptly that already they could swim up to within two or three feet of us we knew that the tide would soon bring them upon us and we turned cold as we thought what our fate would be unless chris could reach us in time then the battle began b and i with our awkward weapons managed to stun a couple of our assailants the rector's boat hook did more deadly execution it tore the throat out of the first fish it struck at once the pack scented their comrade's blood darted on the wounded fish devoured it and crowded after us for more our blows with the oar and gaff served temporarily to disable our assailants but not gash their tough skin but the moment blood was started on one of our enemies his comrades finished the work for us almost every stroke of the boat hook tore a fish which straightway became food for its fellows the most i could do with my gaff was to tap a dogfish on the head when i could and stun him for a while during these exciting minutes the tide was rising with terrible speed the water that now came washing over our toes was a lather of foam and blood through which sharp dark fins and long keen bodies darted and crowded and snapped suddenly one fish fiercer than the rest made a dart at b s leg and its sharp snout just grazed his skin causing him to yell with horror we tried to get our feet out of the water by standing on the highest stones we could find our arms were weary from wielding the oar and the gaff but the rector's boat hook kept up its deadly lunges chris had been firing among our assailants but now beholding our strait he threw down the gun and strained furiously upon his one oar in the endeavor to shove off the boat she would not budge boys brace up brace up cried the rector she'll float in another minute or two we can give these chaps all they want as he spoke his boat hook ripped another fish open he had caught the knack of so using his weapon that he raked his opponents from underneath without wasting an ounce of effort the fight was getting too hot to last a big fish with a most appalling array of fangs snatched at my foot just in time i thrust the broken end of the gaff through his throat and turned him on his back his neighbors took charge of him and he vanished in bloody fragments as i watched this an idea struck me chris i yelled the shad the shad throw them overboard a dozen at a time splendid cried the rector and b panted approvingly that's the talk that'll call em off down came his oar with fresh vigor upon the head of a dogfish which turned at once on its side then the shad began to go overboard 
at first the throwing of the shad produced no visible effect and the attack on us continued in unabated fury then the water began to foam and twist where the shad were dropping and on a sudden we were left alone the whole pack forsook us to attack the shad how they fought and lashed and sprang and tore in one mad turmoil of foam and fish spread em a bit b cried give em a chance or they'll come back at us she's afloat she's afloat he yelled the next moment in frantic delight chris threw out another dozen of fish then he thrust his oar over the stern and the big boat moved slowly toward us at intervals chris stopped and threw out more shad as we eagerly watched his approach the thought occurred to us that when the boat should reach us it would be with the whole pack surrounding it the ravenous creatures seemed almost ready to leap aboard we can use these oars and things as leaping poles suggested b that's what we'll have to do agreed the rector and then he cried to chris bring her side on to the shoal so we can all jump aboard at the same time as the boat drew nearer chris paused again and threw a score of shad far astern away dotted the dogfish and the boat rounded up close before us the agility with which we sprang aboard was remarkable and chris almost hugged us in his joy not another shad shall they get out of me he declared triumphantly well i should rather think not remarked the rector but they might as well have some more dogfish with these words he put his foot upon the gunwale and his unwearying boat-hook went back jubilantly into the battle rapidly loading and firing my shotgun i picked off as many of our enemies as i comfortably could and b by lashing the boat's hatchet at the end of the gaff made a weapon with which he played havoc among our foes but the fray lasted not much longer innumerable as were yet the survivors their hunger was becoming appeased and their ferocity diminished in a little while they sheered off to a safer distance when we had time to think of our own condition we found that our backs were painfully scorched by the blazing june sun as with pain we struggled into our clothes chris trimmed our course toward home i reckon you know now about all you'll want or know about the ways of dogfish he suggested they are certainly very bloodthirsty said the rector but at the same time they are interesting that they gave us a noble contest you can't deny when queerman relapsed into silence ranolf took up the parable without waiting to be called upon queerman's story said he reminds me of an adventure of my own which befell me at that same tide region which he has just been talking of you know i spent much of my illustrious boyhood about the trantramar marshes and overlooking the yellow headwaters of the bay of funday the name of my story is the bull and the leaping pole and the scene of it is within a mile of the spot when squeerman and his crowd set out for shad it will serve to show what agility i am capable of on a suitable occasion the bull and the leaping pole out on the tantramar marshes the wind as usual was racing with superfluous energy bowing all one way the purple timothy tops and rolling up long green waves of grass that shimmered like the sea under the steady afternoon sun i revelled in the fresh and breezy loneliness which nevertheless at times gave me a sort of thrill as the bobolinks stopping their song for a moment left no sound in my ears save the confused swish of the wind men talk at times of the loneliness of the dark but to my mind there is no more utter solitude than may be found in a broad white glare of sunshine here on the marsh two miles from the skirt of the uplands perhaps half a mile from the nearest incurve of the dyke on a twisted sweet-smelling bed of purple vetch i lay pretending to read and deliciously dreaming my bed of vetch sloped gently towards the sun being on the bank of a little winding creek which idled through the long grasses on its way to the tantramar once a tidal stream the creek had been brought into subjection by what the country people call a baito built across its mouth to shut out the tides and now it was little more than a rivulet at the bottom of the deep gash which it had cut for itself through the flats in its days of freedom from my resting-place i could see in the distance a marsh hawk noiselessly skimming the tops of the grass peering for field mice 
or a white gull wandering aimlessly in from the sea beyond the dike rose the gaunt skeletons of three or four empty net reels and a little way off towards the uplands stood an old barn used for storing hay beside me among the vetch blossoms hummed about by the great bumblebees and flickered over by white and yellow butterflies lay my faithful leaping pole a straight young spruce trimmed and peeled light and white and tough some years before fired by reading in hereward of the feats of wolfric the heron i had bent myself to learn to leap with the pole and had become no less skilful in the exercise than eagerly devoted thereto it gave me indeed a most fascinating sense of freedom ditches dikes and fences were of little concern to me and i went craning it over the country like a huge meadow hen on this particular afternoon which i am not likely soon to forget when the bobolinks had hushed for so long that the whispering stillness grew oppressive i became ashamed of the weird apprehension which kept stealing across me and springing to my feet with a shout i seized my leaping pole and went sailing over the creek hilariously it was a good leap and i contemplated the distance with satisfaction marred only by the fact that i had no spectators then i shouted again from full lungs and turning instinctively for applause toward the far-off uplands i became aware that i was not so much alone as i had fancied from behind the old barn at the sound of my voice appeared a head and shoulders which i recognized and at the sight of which my satisfaction vanished they belonged to atkinson's bull a notoriously dangerous brute which only the week before had gored a man fatally and which had thereupon been shut up and condemned to the knife as was evident he had broken out of his pen and wandering hither to the marshes had been luxuriating in such plenty of clover as well might have rendered him mild-mannered i thought of this for a moment but the faint hope it was very faint was at once and emphatically dispelled slowly and with an ugly bellow he walked his whole black and white length into view took a survey of the situation and then after a moment's pawing and some insulting challenges which i did not feel in a position to accept he launched himself toward me with a sort of horrid grunt after the first chill i had quite recovered my nerve and realized at once that my chances lay altogether in my pole the creek was in many places too wide for me to jump it in a clear leap from brink to brink of the gully but at other points it was well within my powers to the bull however i perceived that it would be at all points a serious obstacle only to be passed by clambering first down and then up the steep sides without waiting for close parley with my assailant i took a short run and placed myself once more amongst the vetch blossoms whence i had started i had but time to cast my eye along and noticed that about a stone's throw farther down toward the dike the creek narrowed somewhat so as to afford me an easier leap when the hot brute reached the edge opposite and unable to check himself plunged headlong into the gully as he rolled and snorted in the water i could scarcely help laughing but my triumph was not for long the overthrow seemed to sting him into tenfold fury with a nimbleness that appalled me he charged straight up the bank and barely had i taken to my heels ere he had reached the top and was after me so close was he that i failed to make the point aimed at i was forced to leap desperately and under such disadvantage that only by a hair's breadth did i gain the opposite side somewhat shaken by the effort i ran on straightway to where i could command a less trying jump the bull made no halt whatever but plunged right into the gully rolled over and all covered with mud and streaming weeds was up the slope again like a cat but this performance delayed him and gave me a second or two so that i was enabled to make my leap with more deliberation and less effort as i did so i noticed with gratitude that the banks of the creek had here become much steeper the bull noticed it too and paused bellowing vindictively while as for me i leaned on my trusty pole to regain my breath 
with more circumspection this time the brute attempted the crossing but losing his foothold he came to the bottom as before all in a heap as he gathered himself up again for the ascent i held my ground resolved to move but a yard or two aside when compelled and not lightly to quit a position so much to my advantage but here my foaming adversary found the slope too steep for him and after every charge he fell back ignominiously into the water it did not take him long however to realize the situation and dashing upstream to his former crossing place he was at the top in a twinkling and once more bearing down upon me like a whirlwind of furies the respite had given me time to recover my breath and now with perfect coolness i transferred myself once more to the other side upon this my pursuer wheeled around retraced his steps without a pause crossed over and in a moment i found my position again rendered untenable of course there was nothing else for it but to make another jump and in the result there was no perceptible variation the inexorable brute left me no leisure to sit down and plan a diversion i was conscious of a burning anxiety to get home and i tried to calculate how much of this sort of thing it would take to discourage my tireless foe not arriving at any satisfactory conclusion i continued to make a shuttlecock of myself for some minutes longer immediately below me i saw that the sides of the gully retained their steepness but so widened apart as to make the leap a doubtful one at a considerable distance beyond however they drew together again and at last i convinced myself that a change of base would be justified by such a change supposing it safely accomplished it was evident that i would gain much longer breathing spells while my antagonist would be forced to such detours as would surely soon dishearten him at the next chance therefore i broke at the top of my speed for the new position i had but a scant moment to spare for the bull was closing upon me with his terrible gallop i made my jump nevertheless with deliberation but alas for the best laid schemes of mice and men i had planted my pole in a spot of sticky clay and after a slow sprawl through the air i landed helplessly on hands and knees about halfway up the opposite bank seeing my mishap the bull forgot his late learned caution and charging headlong brought up not a couple of yards below me without waiting to pull my pole out of the mud i scrambled desperately to the top it was a sick moment for me as the brute recovered his footing and made up the steep so impetuously that he almost conquered it but i threw myself flat on my face and reached for the pole knowing well that without it the game was pretty well up for me as i succeeded in wrenching it from the clay my pursuer's rush brought him so close that i could almost touch his snorting and miry nostrils but this was his best effort and he could come no nearer realizing this he did just what i expected him to do gave his tail an extra twist of relentless malice and swept off up the bed of the creek to his former place of transit i now breathed more freely and having prodded the bottom till i found a firm foundation for my pole i began to feel secure when the bull had gained my side of the creek and had come so far as to ensure his coming all the way i sprang across and a moment later saw him tearing up the soil on the very spot my feet had just forsaken this time he shirked the plunge and stood on the bank bellowing his challenge i patted my good spruce pole then i threw some sods across at him which resulted in a fresh tempest a new rush to the old crossing and another over for my leaping pole and me meanwhile i had concocted a plan for checkmating my antagonist i saw that from this point forward to the dike the gully became more and more impassable and i thought if i could lure the bull into following me but for a little way down the opposite bank i could gain such a start upon him that to reach the dike would be an easy matter with this design then when the bull again repeated his angry challenge i shouted through another sod and started on a trot down the creek but the cunning brute was not to be deceived in such fashion he turned at once to repeat his former tactics 
and i was fain to retrace my steps precipitately the brute now resolved apparently upon a waiting game after pawing his defiance afresh he proceeded to walk around and eat a little ever and anon raising his head to eye me with a sullen and obstinate hatred for my own part now that time had ceased to be an object i sat down and racked my brain over the problem would the brute keep up this guard all through the night i felt as if there was a sleuth hound on my trail that now silent presence across the creek began to weigh upon me like a nightmare at last in desperation i resolved upon a straightaway race for the dike as i pondered on the chances they seemed to grow more and more favourable i was a good runner and though handicapped with the pole would have a fair start on my enemy having made up my mind to the venture i rose to my feet ready to seize the smallest advantage as i rose the bull wheeled sharply and sprang to the edge of the bank with a muffled roar but seeing that i stood leaning idly on my pole and made no motion to depart he soon tossed away in the sulks and resumed his grazing in a few moments a succulent streak of clover so engrossed him that he turned his back fairly upon me and like a flash i was off speeding noiselessly over the grass not till several seconds had been gained did i hear the angry bellow which told of the detection of my stratagem i did not stop to look back and i certainly made some very pretty running but the dyke seemed still most dismally remote when i heard that heavy gallop plunging behind me nearer nearer it drew with terrible swiftness and nearer and nearer drew the dyke i reached it where it was perhaps about seven feet high slackening up to plant my pole squarely i sprang and had barely time to steady myself on the summit when the beast brought up with a roar at my very feet it was a narrow a very narrow escape with a sigh of relief and gratitude i sat me down to rest and took some satisfaction in poking the ribs of the baffled brute below then lightly balancing my pole in one hand i turned my face toward the bito and made my way thoughtfully homeward it was altogether too literally a hair's breadth adventure when ranoff concluded there was a general stir pipes were refilled and a snack of biscuits cheese and liquids to taste was passed around then stranion said it's your turn o m but it's bedtime pleaded i and besides as i have the writing to do let others do the speaking my arguments were received with a stony stare so i made haste to begin like magnus said i modesty forbids me to be my own hero i'll tell you a story which i picked up last fall when i was alleged to be pigeon shooting twenty miles above fredericton we will call the yarn saved by the cattle i was talking to an old farmer whom i had chanced to come across and who had passed me a cheery good day after i had spoken of the crops and he had praised my new gun i broached a subject of much interest to myself how do you account for the fact if it is a fact said i slipping a cartridge into my right barrel that the caribou are getting yearly more numerous in the interior of new brunswick while other game seems to be disappearing as for the wild pigeons you may say they are all gone here i have been on the go since before sunrise and that bird is the only sign of a pigeon i have so much as got a glimpse of well replied my companion as for the pigeons i can't say how it is in old times i've seen em so plenty round here you could knock em down with a stick that is if you were anyways handy with a stick but they do say that caribou are increasing because the wolves had disappeared you see the wolves used to be the worst enemy of the caribou because they could run em down nice and handy in winter when the snow was deep and the crust so thin that the caribou were bound to break through it at every step however i don't believe there has been a wolf seen in this part of the country for fifty years and it's only within the last ten years or so that the caribou have got more plenty we had seated ourselves the old farmer and i on a ragged snake fence that bounded a buckwheat field overlooking the river the field was a new clearing and the ripened buckwheat reared its brown heads among a host of blackened and distorted stumps 
it was a crisp and delicious autumn morning and the solitary pigeon that had rewarded my long tramp over the uplands was one that i had surprised at its breakfast in the buckwheat now finding that my new acquaintance was likely to prove interesting i dropped my gun gently into the fence corner loosened my belt a couple of holes and asked the farmer if he had himself ever seen any wolves in new brunswick not to say many was the old man's reply but they say that troubles never come single and so what wolves i have seen i saw them all in a heap so to speak as he spoke the old man fixed his eyes on a hilltop across the river with a far-off look that seemed to promise a story i settled into an attitude of encouraging attention and waited for him to go on his hand stole deep into the pocket of his grey homespun trousers and brought to view a fig of blackjack from which he gnawed a thoughtful bite instinctively he passed the tobacco to me and on my declining it which i did with grave politeness he began the following story when i was a little shaver about thirteen years old i was living on a farm across the river some ten miles up it was a new farm which father was cutting out of the woods but it had a good big bit of interval so we were able to keep a lot of stock one afternoon late in the fall father sent me down to the interval which was a good two miles from the house to bring the cattle home they were pasturing on the aftermath but the weather was getting bad and the grass was about done and father thought the critters as we called them would be much better in the barn my little ten-year-old brother went with me to help me drive them that was the time i found out there were wolves in new brunswick the feed being scarce the cattle were scattered badly and it was supper time before we got them together at the lower end of the interval maybe three miles and a half from home we didn't mind the lateness of the hour however though we were getting pretty hungry for we knew the moon would be up right after sundown the cattle after a bit appeared to catch on to the fact that they were going home to snug quarters and good feed and then they drove easy and hung together when we had gone about halfway up the interval keeping along by the river the moon got up and looked at us over the hills very sharp and thin ah says teddy to me in half a whisper don't she make the shadows black he hadn't got the words more than out of his mouth when we heard a long queer howling sound from away over the other side of the interval and the little fellow grabbed me by the arm with his eyes fairly popping out of his head i can see his startled face now but he was a plucky lad for his size as ever walked what's that he whispered sounds mighty like the wind said i though i knew it wasn't the wind for there wasn't a breath about to stir a feather the sound came from a wooded valley winding down between the hills it was something like the wind high and thin but by and by getting loud and fierce and awful as if a lot more voices were joining in and i just tell you my heart stopped beating for a minute the cattle heard it you'd better believe and bunched together kind of shivering then two or three young heifers started to bolt but the old ones knew better and hooked them back into the crowd then it flashed over me all at once you see i was quite a reader having plenty of time in the long winters says i to teddy with a kind of sob in my throat i guess it must be wolves i guess so says teddy getting brave after his first start and then not a quarter of a mile away we saw a little pack of gray brutes dart out of the woods into the moonlight i grabbed teddy by the hand and edged in among the cattle let's get up a tree said teddy of course we will said i with a new hope rising in my heart we looked about for a suitable tree in which we might take refuge but our hopes sank when we saw there was not a decent-sized tree in reach father had cleared off everything along the river bank except some indian willow scrub not six feet high if the cattle now had scattered for home i guess it would have been all up with teddy and me and father and mother would have been mighty lonesome on the farm but what do you suppose the critters did when they saw those gray things just lengthening themselves out across the meadow the old cows and the steers made a regular circle putting the calves with me and teddy in the center they backed in on to us pretty tight and stood with their heads out and horns down for all the world like a company of militia forming square to receive a charge of cavalry 
and right good bayonets they made those long fine horns of our cattle to keep from being trodden on teddy and i got on to the backs of a couple of yearlings who didn't like it any too well but were packed in so tight they couldn't help themselves as the wolves came streaking along through the moonlight they set up again that awful shrill wind-like swelling howl and i thought of all the stories i had read of the wolves of russia and norway and such countries and the thought didn't comfort me much i didn't know what i learned afterward that the common wolf of north america is much better fed than his cousins in the old world and consequently far less bloodthirsty i seemed to see fire flashing from the eyes of the pack that were rushing upon us and i thought their white fangs glistening in the moonlight were dripping with the blood of human victims i expect father'll hear that noise whispered ted and he and bill that was the hired man will come with their guns and save us yes said i scornfully i suppose you'd like them to come along now and get eaten up by the wolves i was mighty sorry afterward for speaking that way for it near broke teddy's heart however sobbing a bit the little fellow urged in self-defense why there's only five wolves anyway and father and bill could easily kill them it was true there were just five of the brutes though my excited eyes had been seeing about fifty just such a pack as i had been used to reading about however these five seemed mighty hungry and now they were right on to us i guess they weren't used to cattle like ours father's old black and white bull was running the affair that night and he stood facing the attack the wolves never halted but with their red tongues hanging out and their narrow jaws snapping like fox traps they gave a queer nasty gasp that it makes my blood run cold to think of and sprang right on to the circle of horns we heard the old bull mumble something away down in his throat and he sort of heaved up his hindquarters and pitched forward without leaving the ranks the next thing we saw one of his long horns was through the belly of the leader wolf and the animal was tossed up into the air yelping like a kicked dog he came down with a thud and lay snapping at the grass and kicking while the other four who had been repulsed more or less roughly drew back and eyed their fallen comrade with an air of disapproval i expected to see them jump upon him and eat him at once but they didn't and i began to distrust the stories i had read about wolves it appeared however that it was not from any sense of decency that they held back but only that they wanted beef rather than wolf meat as we found a little later presently one of the four slouched forward and sniffed at his dying comrade the brute was still lively however and snapped his teeth viciously at the other's legs who thereupon slouched back to the pack after a moment of hesitation the four stole silently in single file round and round the circle turning their heads so as to glare at us all the time and looking for a weak spot to attack they must have gone round us half a dozen times and then they sat down on their tails and stuck their noses into the air and howled and howled for maybe five minutes steady teddy and i who were now feeling sure our critters could lick any number of wolves came to the conclusion the brutes thought they had too big a job on their hands and were signalling for more forces let em come exclaimed teddy but we were getting altogether too confident as we soon found out after howling for a while the wolves stopped and listened then they howled again and again they stopped and listened but still no answer came at this they got up and once more began prowling around the circle and everywhere they went you could see the long horns of the cattle pointing in their direction i can tell you cattle know a thing or two more than they get credit for well when the wolves came round to their comrade's body they saw it was no longer kicking and one of them took a bite out of it by way of an experiment he didn't seem to care for wolf and turned away discontentedly the idea struck teddy as so funny that he laughed aloud the laugh sounded out of place and fairly frightened me the cattle stirred uneasily and as for teddy he wished he had held his tongue for the wolf turned and fixed his eyes upon him and drew nearer and nearer till i thought he was going to spring over the cattle's heads and seize us but in a moment i heard the old bull mumbling again in his throat 
and the wolf sprang back just in time to keep from being gored how i felt like hugging that bull i cheered teddy up and told him not to laugh or make a noise again as the little fellow lifted his eyes he looked over my shoulder and instantly forgetting what i had been saying shouted here come father and bill i looked in the same direction and saw them sure enough riding furiously towards us but the wolves didn't notice them and resumed their prowling on the other side of the circle from our champion the black and white bull there stood a nervous young cow and just at this time the wolf who had got his eye on teddy seemed to detect this weak spot in the defence suddenly he dashed like lightning on the timid cow who shrank aside wildly and opened a passage by which the wolf darted into the very centre of the circle the brute made straight for teddy whom i snatched from his perch and dragged over against the flank of the old bull instantly the herd was in confusion the young cow had bounded into the open and was rushing wildly up the interval and three of the wolves were at her flanks in a moment the wolf who had marked teddy for his prey leaped lightly over a calf or two and was almost upon us when a red mooley cow the mother of one of these calves butted him so fiercely as to throw him several feet to one side before he could reach us a second time the old bull had spotted him wheeling in his tracks as nimble as a squirrel he knocked me and teddy over like a couple of ninepins and was on to the wolf in a flash how he did mumble and grumble way down in his stomach but he fixed the wolf he pinned the brute down and smashed him with his forehead and then amused himself tossing the body in the air and just at this moment father and bill rode up and snatched us two youngsters on to their saddles are you hurt questioned father breathlessly but he saw in a moment we were not for we were flushed with pride at the triumph of our old bull and be they any more wolves so i can get a shot at em queried bill old spot has fixed two of em said i and there's the other two eatin poor whitey over there exclaimed teddy pointing at a snarling knot of creatures two or three hundred yards across the interval sure enough they had dragged down poor whitey and were making a fine meal off her carcass but bill rode over and spoiled their fun he shot two of them while the other left like a gray streak and that's the last i've seen of wolves in this part of the country that was a close shave said i and the cattle showed great grit i've heard of them adopting tactics like that well said the old farmer getting down from the fence rail and picking up his tin can i must be moving good day to you before he had taken half a dozen steps he turned round and remarked i suppose now if those had been norway wolves or russian wolves the critters would have had no show very little i imagine was my answer whether it was that my story had gone far toward putting every one to sleep i know not the fact remains to be interpreted as one will that no longer was there any objection raised when i proposed that we should turn in that night i think no one of us lay awake over long before i dropped asleep i heard two owls hooting hollowly to each other through the wet woods the sound changed gradually to a clamour of wolves over their slain victim and then to the drums and trumpets of an army on the march and then i awoke to find it broad daylight and stranion beating a tin pan just over my head End of chapter two